So my name is Steve Guttenberg. My guest today is Ben. And you have a couple of dogs. Yeah. A few. Yeah. Two. Yeah, two. But they're big, so they seem like more than two to me. Uh, so my question is, uh, well, you're, you're an architect? Yes. So what, what kind of architect are you? Um, I mean, I do just about everything. Um, I'll, I end up doing a lot of residential. Um, I've done you know, a decent amount of commercial. I design furniture. Um, all of this stuff is all stuff I've designed oh, nice. and built uh, for my equipment. And downstairs, I have guitar cabinets and stuff that I've built and another kind of uh, secondary system just for like uh, the odd, for the video stuff that mm -hmm. um, that sits in some cabinets that I've built also design and built. Do you play? I guess yeah, you know. a little bit, you know, for fun mostly, but mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of, you know, my second hobby. I have a 1933 L00, Gibson L00. Um, I have a 66 Fender Jazzmaster. And um, and then I have a couple contemporary guitars. I have a, a modern jazz master, and I have a, uh, um, a Collings, a modern Collings uh, Julian Lane guitar, like an, an orchestra model. But you're you're a, a new a newly minted audiophile. Is that fair? Um, I've I've yeah. I mean that that's that's probably true. I've always been interested in it. My, my father was really into audio gear, uh -huh. um, but he did never really had, you know, the, the means to, uh, to, to do it, um, in the way that, that I've been kind of pursuing it. He built a lot of his own stuff. Um, so I grew up, you know, with my, in my dad's workshop where he was building speakers and, um, and I grew up with all that stuff and the, uh, um, the, the horn phonograph was my yeah, father's. Yeah, it's in the shot. Yeah. And, uh, oh, um, really? Wow. Uh, so, um, so I ended up with that from him. So a lot of this came started started with my father, but I've I, I think I've always had um, decent audio gear, but it was you know I, I just you know had the um, the integrated receivers and stuff you know for a long time and you know started with the kind of early like the Yamaha and Nokia stuff and then kind of moved up from there and and I still have some of that stuff in, in a second system downstairs for uh, um, for you know for the AV stuff mm -hmm. and but then I kind of maybe about five or six years ago kind of got a little bit more into the having the, the second system the two channel system stuff and started with some of the kind of buying used like rogue audio equipment uh, because the stuff is really reasonably priced and the uh, um, record player for instance you know I bought and from a from a, an estate sale and um, and then upgraded it I had sent it to Virginia and had the Krebs modification done to to it and um, and then upgraded the tone arm and um, what, what is the arm? I it's it's a it's a Technics arm, um, but it's a rare arm. It's a it's one of the Boron uh, arms that it came with one of the kind of higher end models originally that oh. it, from Japan and was never really released here. Um, so that I bought that tone arm from Japan, um, but the but the uh, uh, the plinth and the record player itself was from here. But I had to have it completely rebuilt. Hmm. Um, and uh, um, and then you know, the phono preamp, uh, the Heron, Heron audio. It's like you know again, it's like one of those components that's considered to be for the money, you know, like super, you know, good. But it's tubes, right? Yeah, it's all tube. It's 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 all tube. Uh, before I had some, when I had some of the rogue stuff, I I had uh, um, some of the class D like hybrid stuff, and and I upgraded from that and went into all tube. You know, a lot of the music I listen to, I think, it's also requires a lot more detail, and so some of the kind of uh, two, you know, the the kind of two B sound that you're, you know, that that you would normally associate with having all tube equipment, I try and get stuff that's a little bit more uh, that that's got a, a little bit more detail. Okay. It. And like the the LTA um, preamp, the linear tube audio stuff is it's it's all tube, but um, the technology they use tends to be a, um, um, yeah, tends to give it a little bit more of a detailed sound. Rather. Oh yeah. Well, it's designed by David Burning, you yes. know, and he's like uh, amazing. I should do a, I should do a video with him at some point. I go way back with him. 
Not that I've seen him in ages, but I know him from a long time ago. The what's that? The, what is the the power amp? The power amp is Almic. It's a South Korean company. Almic, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's pretty serious stuff. Uh, well, on the digital front end, I have um, just a, a transport, uh, uh, the Arlic. Uh, transport. Okay. Uh, and that's just a streaming server, and then um, and then the cord upsampler, the M scaler, and the uh, um, and then the uh, uh, DAC is the um, Hugo uh, tabletop version. Oh, okay. That's okay. It. So uh, so that's all the digital front end, and then that all runs obviously through right, right. Uh, through there, and then my analog end is up on up on the top on the top shelves. So, so, so Ben, tell me a little bit about the speakers. I, I've heard them before, um, and they're kind of local because Oswald's Mill is is here in Brooklyn. Yeah, right? yeah, their their studio is here in Dumbo. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think their their shops are in Pennsylvania. Yeah, right. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, Jonathan, I met a couple years ago, and um, he's he's an acquaintance, he's a friend, I guess, uh, and. Uh, I've taken a couple of visits to his uh, shop over the years, and um, in the past, you know, it was always a little bit of a pipe dream because the stuff that he was making at the time was completely, uh, yeah, 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 not affordable. Very high end, yeah. Um, but I have kind of always kept it in the back of my mind, and then, you know, I reached out to him about uh, about a year ago, maybe six months ago, and uh, just to pick his brain a little bit, and he had, he had been mentioning that he was going to be working on a speaker that was a little bit more affordable. And uh, so I went over to his studio um, to demo them, and I brought a friend of mine, and uh, we both ended up uh, reading with the pair. Wow! Um, Yikes! Yeah, yeah, it wasn't totally expected <laughs> to happen. <laughs> oh, and and then everything kind of cascaded from there. I I didn't I did, a lot of the equipment that I have here now I did not have when the speakers came first, and then I had to oh. uh, upgrade to match. Huh. And the, and the stands come with the speaker? That's part of the... Yeah, yeah. There's a couple of options for the stands. But, you know, as, as an architect, the, um, you know, I, I think his stuff sounds amazing. But the thing that, that he does super well um, that a lot of the other companies are not doing are the aesthetics. And that, <laughs> yes, I that, agree. that part of it is so important to me as a, as a designer. And, sure, um, yeah. Actually, a lot of the equipment I pick... I mean, obviously, I don't get stuff just for the way it looks. It's got to sound good, too. But the... Aesthetics play a role in in, uh, in everything that I and and how it's about. and how and that's just the visual aesthetics, but how it's what it's made of the yeah. materials yeah, yeah. Uh, and all that. I yeah, I'm always amazed that there's so little of that in high end audio. In you know, in the crazy expense, even in the insanely expensive stuff, some of it looks pretty and everything, but <clears throat> I'm just shocked. Well, not shocked because I'm so used to it, but it's, it's I don't understand why they can't do it except that. So many uh, techies and designers aren't aesthetically, that's not their orientation. Yeah. So they have to go to other people and then it gets messy. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think Jonathan has an industrial designer that he works with, which yeah. is, I think is super smart. Um, and then the same thing with uh, uh, the linear tube audio stuff that he used for Roby, which yeah. is uh, a design company. And yeah. so I have a lot of respect for that too. I mean, I think, uh, I, I totally agree. I think, I, I think too much hi-fi stuff just doesn't look very good yeah and i mean it's it's okay yeah. but it doesn't it doesn't have that kind of thing that you go it's supposed to stop you in your tracks yeah. not just because of the way it sounds yeah it's like ferraris they go fast yeah. but they have a look that's beyond speed yeah. it's their and own people, and people buy them because they're beautiful too right and and if you're you know i think when you're talking about two channel stuff when you know it requires a certain amount of attention right you're you're sitting and you're paying attention to this stuff. Right. You're, you're looking at, at it. You're looking at it. You're not staring at the wall. <laughs> right. So, um, so it makes perfect sense that you know that the the equipment should be a piece of art as well, and right. the speakers definitely are. I mean, people walk into the house here, and um, they just look expensive, you know. And and when you're spending that kind of money on equipment, it should. You know, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah it was, that was I was going to say. So when when friends come by who are not into the hobby, when they see it, how do they react? Uh, there, I mean, it, it kind of it, it takes them back a little bit. I mean, they're they're kind of like, oh, that's an art piece, you know. Right. And it, maybe it does something else too. But I mean, that's the uh, uh, that that's what's really nice about it. And you know, I design my own house, and and um, and so it's important to me that you know, in in a small space, that you know, if I'm going to put something quite large in there, that it's got to be beautiful mm. too. And I think that that's one of the things that. Um, 
that Jonathan does so well uh, in, with his equipment. Over time, you, you, know, you start to become desensitized your own, to your own stuff, but sure. the visuals never really change, right? Like, you know, it, it, it's the, the, what you hear you know, sound, may have sounded amazing when you first you know, started listening to it, but you know, over time, it kind of, you start to become accustomed to it, but you know, the aesthetics never change, right? The aesthetics are always a constant. Mm -hmm. um, you have a piece of art that you're in love with, it's always going to look beautiful when you walk into the space. Right. And the other thing is when you play records, you're touching the turntable, you're pulling yeah. out the record, you're putting it on, so that how it, literally how it feels uh, becomes part of it. Yeah. You know, like I've lived with a lot of stuff over the years that I thought sounded good and was well made, but it just didn't feel right. right. And eventually that means that I, I, I got to move on from this. So yeah. it may have done other things really, really well, but just, just kind of gets to me like, no, no, I want something that feels better. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. Um, I was never like, I was never really into the kind of more vintage turntables. It was Jonathan that actually turned me on to these old techniques. Right. Uh, um, turntables, I always had belt driven tables and, um, and the, 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 these older direct drive tables, just they definitely feel more solid. Even when you turn them on, it's not the same experience. Yeah, 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 yeah. definitely. Um, and I didn't, you know, I, I never totally understood that until, until I owned one. Um, and, and other people in the house, my wife is not, you know, she appreciates the, the, the audio gear, but it's not her hobby. And, mm -hmm. um, but she, you know, comments, she's like, I like this record player so much more than, than what you've had before. Uh -huh. uh, because the other one was just a little bit sloppy. To, yeah, know. yeah, it's fussier, yeah. you know. Yeah, absolutely. So, but you grew up around tubes, so that wasn't like a new thing for you getting back into tubes. Yeah, I mean, not even necessarily tube audio equipment only. My dad had tube electronics, period. Uh -huh. and, and, you know, he had all, some of those, like, oscillators, and, like, he had a lot of testing equipment that oh, was wow. on tube. And, um, yeah, so I was, I was always around that stuff. Mm. It's, it, I mean, that's one of the most amazing things about audio, is that, you know, it goes through these, these uh, phases, solid, you know, tubes, we'll start, obviously, with tubes. Then solid state comes in, and a company like Macintosh says, "We're done with tubes. Solid state so much better. We're never going to go back to tubes." <clears throat> Years, decades go by. Then one by one, they start to make some tube electronics, and now tube electronics are not—I wouldn't say the bulk of their sales, but they're very significant in their sales. So it goes out of fashion, into fashion. Um, but there is something about tube electronics. I think that uh, it has its own thing, and sometimes. People say, not usually me, that some solid state gear approaches tubes. Uh, maybe, but not really. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah uh, and it's never. the same thing with analog versus digital. That sometimes it's funny that people will say that when digital is so good, some people would say it sounds like analog, but no one would ever say when analog is really good, it sounds like digital. Yeah. yeah the, <laughs> no, the, analog is sort of the standard that you're moving towards, not moving towards better and better digital, which is ironic because, I mean, digital has gotten better and better over the decades. But in the end, um, no one ever says great analog sounds like digital. Yeah, the ceiling is a lot higher <laughs> with, uh, yeah. with analog equipment for sure. I mean, I think I probably have more money invested in the digital just to kind of keep up with the analog stuff. Yeah. So uh, uh, you have to you have to spend a lot more on the digital stuff to kind of get near uh, where the analog stuff will get, you know, on its yeah. own. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's expensive in both directions, but, yeah. I, but I understand what you're saying, absolutely. Yeah. But yeah, and when I, when I listen, I listen, when I'm listening, listening as opposed to reviewing, I listen to one or the other. You know, a night I'll listen to just vinyl. Or I'll listen to digital, but I won't play a couple of a couple of LPs and some CDs that are stream. No, it's it's one or the other. Yeah, it's too yeah. jarring to go between them. I'm the same way. I mean, I I think I think the only reason I listen to digital stuff at all now is just to figure out what I want to buy on record. Mm -hmm. It just gives me the opportunity to hear something. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, can, I can tell if something's a good recording, you know, uh, um, by listening to a high quality digital file. And, and I can tell if I really like it, so it allows me to test drive it. And then if it's something that I want to sit with, then, mm. then I'll buy it on vinyl. I think we're good, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs>
I'll do my, uh, my outro. My name is Steve Guttenberg. Uh, this is the Audiophiliac Daily Show. My guest today is Ben. He's an architect. We're in Brooklyn, and it's a beautiful day. So thanks, Ben. Thanks for letting me. Uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for doing this. In. It's awesome. Thank you.